Hello and welcome to Study IQ. I am your friend Rahul Sayankar. I hope you're all in good spirits. Today, we'll continue our discussion of the Spectrum's modern Indian history. Previously, we discussed about the sources of modern Indian history. We also spoke about the different approaches to modern Indian history. Today, we'll begin with the advent of Europeans. At the beginning of the class, I told you that modern Indian history would be in the range of 1600 to 1947, where I'll tell you how the British consolidated their rule, the administration of the British, and how we strived for our own independence. The revolt of 1857, the birth of Congress, the different movements, the Swadeshi movement, the non-cooperation movement, chief, the civil disobedience movement, and the Quit India movement. Ultimately, how we got independence. That would be the domain of our discussion. But first we need to understand how did the British arrive, right? Now, before the British, many other Europeans came to India. The British first defeated some Indian kingdoms, then they defeated some European challengers like the Portuguese, the Dutch, the French, and eventually consolidated the rule in the subcontinent. So let's try to understand the advent of Europeans, how the Europeans arrived or why the Europeans arrived. If not British, then who was the first colonizer or who was the first European power to come to India? If they were the first, if they had a head start, then why couldn't they rule in India? Why did British emerge as the most powerful kingdom? That would be the agenda in this particular chapter. In fact, this chapter would be divided into two parts. Today, it will be the part one of the discussion. And here we'll talk about the initial European travelers or initial European traders who came into India. And our focus in this particular discussion would be on understanding the Portuguese. The first to arrive in India were the people from Portugal. We all know Vasco da Gama arrived in India in 1498. First Portuguese, then some other European powers came. Eventually, the British prevailed. So today we'll understand about the Portuguese, the Dutch and the Danes. And in the part two, we'll talk about the consolidation by the British rule. And we'll also talk about the Anglo-French rivalry in our part two of the advent of Europeans. That, that's the agenda in today's discussion. Let's begin. But before that, if you're preparing for UPS civil service examination or state PSC examination, do visit studyiq.com or you can also download our app from Google Play Store where you'll get all the information about us. And if you're buying any course on Study IQ, I'd request you to use the code RAHUL, R-A-H-U-L 33. At the checkout, you'll get 33% discount on any course, any course that you buy on Study IQ. Do avail this discount. Right, let's begin the discussion. As I told you, we are today going to discuss about the advent of Europeans. So who were the first Europeans to arrive in India and when did they arrive? The first things first, who came first? First is Portuguese. In fact, this question has arrived to arrange the advent of the Europeans in chronological order. Although in today's pattern, or I would call the new pattern of UPSC preliminary examination, you seldom get questions on the basis of dates. But as I always tell, it's unexpected public service commission. So you might expect questions from any field, chronological order, any sort of order. So first came the Portuguese. To be very precise, Vasco da Gama arrived in India in 1498. Right? But uh, they set up the factory in 1509 because Vasco da Gama returned, then again came back in 1501, he set up his own factory. Then the Portuguese company, Portuguese administration, they sent their governors and their rule started in 1509. After that, the Dutch came. The Dutch company was set up in 1602, but they set up a factory in India in 1605. The third were British. Please note this. The first were Portuguese, the second were Dutch, the third were British. The fourth were Danes, Danes meaning people from Denmark. So they arrived for a very short period, but they did not have any sort of colonial ambitions. They were, they were mostly traders and eventually they, they sold, I would say not lost per se, but they sold all their factories, all their, all their assets to British. And finally came the French. In fact, the British and the French rivalry has been very prominent because uh, not just in India, please try to remember the British and the French, they were 
they were rivals everywhere wherever the colonizers went the british and french rivalry was very very prominent and before we begin the discussion i want to tell you something since we started here at the end of the 15th century meaning our discussion would predominantly be revolving around the 16th century and the 17th century here one point that you have to remember is during the 16th century meaning from 1500 to 1600 right the power struggle or or in the european uh, arena more and more power was with two main giants and two giants were portugal and spain right just just have this fact at the back of your mind because this will help this will help you in answer writing also during 1500 to 1600 two major giants were portugal and spain now you might have a question sir if portugal and spain were two giants then why did the spanish did not come to india you'll get the answer very soon but the power dynamics shifted in the 17th century in the 17th century the power dynamics shifted more and more towards the british and towards the french right just just have this thing in the back of your mind that the 16th century belonged to portugal and spain they were the major powers because uh, they had the navies uh, they had the forces right and they had uh, some uh, some strong rulers who wanted to spread their geographical territories but the 17th century it belonged to two biggest colonizers the british and the french and to some extent to dutch also right with that background let's begin our discussion let's try to understand why on the first sight these europeans came to india at all what was the reason behind these europeans coming into india now for this thing to be understood we need to have certain facts we need to understand certain facts now when we talk about the ancient culture or ancient history we always say that india was one of the greatest civilization in fact it was apart from india there was the chinese indian and the chinese civilization were very predominant during the ancient times that means the ancient century or the ancient era it belonged to india and china but during the medieval period and i would say at the cusp of medieval and the modern period the power shifted towards the europeans and here was the power center the entire international relations the entire international politics was eurocentric for a very very long period almost i'd say from 15th century till the 20th century the politics of the world has been very eurocentric why because the european powers emerged as the main economic centers like the netherlands the french the portuguese the spanish the british so these these powers gained more and more military might more and more economic might now apart from that during the period of 1453 you'll understand why it has been mentioned 1453 it's a political map of 1453 who controlled what during this period let let's have a small backdrop of this as i told you in england or in europe for that matter it was monarchy itself it was the english king the french king the portuguese king queen the dutch king queen the the monarchs they ruled and just beside the european continent we have here the west asian region asia minor right asia minor was the region today we call it as turkey asia minor was a connecting link between the asians and the europeans and right from the ancient times uh, we have had trade relations with the european side with mesopotamia with many regions from west asia isn't it so from ancient times this was the trade route which we say as a silk road from here they used to reach to the asian side to china to india this was a trade route from india also many things used to go to europe we were uh, we were a, a very great producing uh, market we used to we used to produce pearls we had spices we had so many things in india and uh, the chinese tea the chinese herbs were very well known so trade was flourishing in this particular region but in 1453 a very important incident happened because of which the entire world politics changed the europeans used to trade with us the orientalists the west asians also used, used to trade with the orientalists obviously now if this is the the producing region if this is the trading region the middle region is the ottoman empire here now the ottoman empire for for any passage you have to pay you have to pay something right because they are giving you passage so it was a trade route so everybody used to earn money here in fact this was the most important trade route in the world itself right and everybody was looking to gain prominence over this trade route 
Now add to this the complication of religion. Because if you look at the region, if you look at the region predominantly here, uh, see, European continent, it was dominated by the Christianity, right? The Pope was the head in Italy or Rome, uh, the papal state was situated and on the other side, there was the Islamic culture in the Ottoman Empire, in the Safavid Empire, etc. You found, you found out Islam here and we all know that both of these religions are proselytizing religions. That means they focus more and more on conversion. So this was an era when there was a constant tussle between the two religions, Christianity and Islam. And as I told you, Asia Minor, that is Turkey and the capital city of Turkey, Istanbul, it was called Constantinople. Constantinople was a connecting link, both the maritime connecting link, land connecting link between the two regions. And what used to happen is there used to be continuous religious fights because medieval era was dominated by religion. There used to be religious fights from Christianity. They used to call it crusade. So they used to come towards the Asian side, the West Asian side. They used to fight wars. As soon as they conquer, they used to convert people into Christianity. That was called crusade. And the Islamists, that is uh, the Muslims, they retaliated by something called as jihad. So they went towards the European side, predominantly Eastern European side. When they conquered, they converted people into the Islamic religion. So this constant seesaw battle between the two religions was going on along with the competition for dominance in trade, trade towards this particular region that is India and the Chinese region. And the important trade route was the land-based trade route. As I told you from Europe, if I have to reach India, this was the land route. And if I had to reach by water from the Mediterranean Sea, I used to come to, from the Red Sea towards India. Now, that was the maritime route that was known to people. Now, please remember there was a tussle going on between two religions, Christianity and Islam. First of all, for the dominance of the religion and next for the dominance of the trade routes. That was the condition. But something changed in 1453. In 1453, the Constantinople or Istanbul, which was considered as a connecting link between Europe and Asia, it fell. Now, it fell to whom? It fell to Ottoman Empire. Ottoman Empire's king, Mehmed II, he eventually subjugated Constantinople. In fact, before Mehmed II, so many other rulers had tried to capture Constantinople. It is said that Constantinople had huge walls which nobody could destroy. And in the Constantinople, it was the capital city of the Byzantine Empire, the Roman Empire basically, the, the uh, latest Roman Empire I might say. So many people, many Ottoman rulers before Mehmet II tried to capture Constantinople, everybody failed. Eventually Mehmet II captured Constantinople in 1453. In fact, there is a very, very interesting docu-series on Netflix called as the Ottoman Empire. Do, do watch it on your free time, not during the time of the preparation. Uh, you will get a good insight into how exactly Constantinople was captured. A very, uh, very interesting docu-series. So after the capture of Con Constantinople, the trade routes for these Europeans was completely stopped and somehow the Ottoman Empire had gained more and more prominence. In fact, the Byzantine Empire eventually fell and whatever areas of the Byzantine Empire towards the, mid towards the Mediterranean, towards the Northern Africa, towards the West Africa, all those areas, they went to Ottoman Empire. But the Western European monarchs, France, Portugal, Spain, England, Netherlands, they tried to rally behind Christianity. Yes. So they were looking for an alternate route towards India for trading because they knew now this particular route is closed. I cannot go from here. I cannot even go from Red Sea because the Ottoman Empire controlled the uh, Suez Canal or, or the Suez region and eventually the Red Sea also was captured by them, controlled by them. Now they were looking for some sort of a new route for India. What happened eventually in the European side, spirit of Renaissance began. Spirit, spirit of Renaissance means people started to move from the medieval outlook into the modern era. Reformation of their own religion began. New ideas began. Focus on humanism began. Enlightenment was focused. Now, people started to do more and more business. For example, in Florence, in Italy, it was a center of trade. So people started to focus more and more on trade and economic development. And European continent itself slowly and steadily emerged as the center of trade and because of the spirit of renaissance because of 
focus on scientific ideas focus on humanism focus on uh, enlightenment people started to look for new places and new geographical discoveries were promoted by many monarchs for example portugal's henry the navigator was very prominent he was hell bent on finding new land towards either side towards the north american side also and towards the eastern side towards india in fact there were many there were many uh, voyages which were sponsored by the kings to find the indies that is india the east indies but many people reached towards these land because these lands were again traditional lands you can see here at that time it was the aztec empire and the inca empire inca empire in the southern america aztec in the caribbean region mexico in the caribbean region you had aztec empire the northern american region and many parts of southern american region they were uninhabited for a very long time so what happened geographical discoveries began many people started their voyages christopher columbus started voyage bartolomeo diaz started voyage vasco da gama started a voyage so everybody went to seek of see, everybody went to went to seek new places right apart from that the treaty of tordesillas was signed in 1494 this is a very important treaty which will give you an answer why the spanish people did not arrive in india see i told you in the 16th century the two most prominent powers were portugal and spain why because they had their navies they had their militaries they had naval power and at that time whoever was a naval power they could venture out into seas find new lands find treasures right so what happened in 1494 both of them they, they signed a treaty of tordesillas in which they had an understanding now from the european side just divide the world into two spots the spanish would venture towards this side and the portuguese would venture towards this side they divided the entire world along the atlantic ocean one side to the portuguese the other side to the spain and the spanish voyages they went towards the northern american side the portuguese voyages they began towards our side that is towards the asian side now eventually in 1498 a major discovery happened as i told you the earlier route was through the red sea if i have to travel uh, through a maritime route from here i used to travel from mediterranean then reach into red sea and then reach indian coasts but now this was also blocked the land route was also blocked so what happened people started to find new routes from portugal bartolomeo diaz left first he discovered the cape of good hope that is the southern coast of african continent vasco da gama followed the same route of bartolomeo diaz and eventually started from portugal and he reached the indian subcontinent indian coast to calicut in 1498 now this was the beginning of the advent of europeans the portuguese started first as soon as the portuguese came the portuguese kept the route secret for themselves in fact the portuguese naval power was very superior and as i told you everybody was looking for these places the british were looking for these places the french were looking for these places apart from spanish because the spanish had the other area for themselves that is true but the dutch the danes everybody was looking for the sea route towards india but the portuguese discovered it and they hid it almost for half a century i can or i can say for almost a century because they had the trade dominance here in 1498 vasco da gama reached to calicut he discovered a new place and he reached calicut by passing through the cape of good hope that is the southern southern end of african continent when he reached to calicut he was a trader when he reached to calicut people in india they were very excited they saw something new the king of uh, the king of calicut zamorin he welcomed vasco da gama so vasco da gama was welcomed he he stayed in uh, calicut for uh, many months eventually the very next year in 1499 he returned to portugal with a with a big cargo and the cargo it got him huge profits worth 64 times whatever he took from india he took spices he took many ornaments he took pearls etc from india and when he went to portugal he made huge profits 64 times the profit of the cargo that he took from calicut to portugal this was the opportunity which europeans were looking for because they were they, they were developing economically the trade was flourishing they wanted a place they wanted a route they found out a route they looked for the place that was india so 
the connects between Europeans and Indians in the modern times began. First came Vasco da Gama in 1498. He went back in 1499, returned again in 1501 along with Pedro Alvarez Cabral. He was also a trader. In 1501 itself, Vasco da Gama set up his, his own factory in Calicut. In fact, the first time when he arrived, arrived in 1498, he had good relations with King Zamorin. He returned with huge profits to Portugal. When he came back, uh, he, the relations with King, they soured, they deteriorated. And from that time, the continuous tussle between the Portuguese and the Indians began. The Portuguese eventually sent their first governor, Francisco de Almeida, to India, who started Portuguese administration in India. One of the most successful governor of Portugal was Alfonso de Albuquerque. Albuquerque acquired Goa from the Sultan of Bijapur in 1510. Now, the question in front of us is, was it really easy for the Portuguese to capture India? Now, if you look at this particular map, you'll realize in 1453, what was the situation? Focus here on South Asia, various regional kingdoms dominated in India. Now, if you focus on this particular time period, initially uh, around 1200, the slave dynasty started, slave dynasty 1, slave dynasty 2. Uh, then uh, there were many other smaller dynasties in India towards the southern side also and the northern side also. India was a fragmented piece. So there were many kingdoms, there were many princes, many kingdoms. There was the lack of unity which gave an opportunity for Europeans to set up their bases. So they eventually arrived and set up their bases at different places. As I told you, the important governors were Francisco de Almeida, Alfonso de Albuquerque who was the most successful one. In fact, historians say he was the most ruthless also. After that, Nino da Cunha also came. Nino da Cunha eventually shifted the capital city from Cochin to Goa. And Goa remained the capital city of Portugal in India for many years. Under different governors, Francisco de Almeida, Alfonso de Albuquerque, Nino da Cunha, the Portuguese slowly and steadily started to establish their domination, especially towards the western coast of India because they arrived in Calicut, they captured Goa, they captured Mumbai, they captured Diu and Daman, they captured Basin, they captured many places. In fact, the entire Asian coast from Hormuz in Persia Gulf to Malacca to Malaya, it was all captured by the Portuguese, not just India because once you found out the route to India, the Portuguese ventured from here, they captured this entire coast, the western coast of India, the Southeast Asian region, Indonesia, the Malay Peninsula, everything was captured by the Portuguese. They set up their bases because they were traders, they were looking for, they were looking for something at these places. And we all know that the Oriental region is known for spices, the Oriental, is, Oriental region is known for its own speciality. The pearls, the, uh, the, the good business opportunities here, it attracted the Portuguese. So, as I told you, they captured Hormuz in Gulf, uh, the Persian Gulf, in uh, Malacca, the Malay Peninsula, Indonesia, everything was captured. And the expansion of Portuguese territory in India and in the Southeast Asia was predominantly due to the efforts of Alfonso de Albuquerque. He was the most successful governors of Portugal, I can say who had expanded their territory towards the Asian region. In fact, at that time, as I told you, during the 16th century, there were two major naval powers, Spain, but they were on the other side, Portugal towards this side. They subjugated region by region, but in India, they could not subjugate the entire mainland, but the coastal region, the western coast and many parts of eastern coast were conquered by the Portuguese. In 1530, the next governor, Nino da Cunha, he captured Diu Basin from Bahadur Shah of Gujarat. The Portuguese eventually expanded and established their settlements. Now, when I tell settlements here, settlement means they set up a factory. Now, factory does not mean any producing unit. Factory is like a storage unit where uh, they would bring goods that they have collected from the Indians. They would keep it in the factory and they would ship it to Portugal or other places of business. All right? So, they set up their establishment of factories in Salset, Daman, Bombay on the west coast. They even reached the eastern coast near Madras in Santhom. They set up a factory in Hooghly in Bengal on the east coast. They set up a factory. Um, now, in fact, over this Hooghly, there was a fight between Portuguese and the British later on. Hooghly, we know, uh, was the center of British as well. So not just on the western coast. The western coast were already captured. 
major ports were captured by them then they moved towards the eastern coast also and towards southeast asia as well now a question that comes in our minds why did the portuguese capture so much of coast in india very easily was there no ruler in india at that time who could have stopped them the answer would be yes because in india there was no strong ruler at that time as as you saw in the map in 1450s later on in the 1500s also there was no central rule in india in fact the mughal rule it started in 1526 when uh, babar defeated ibrahim lodi in the first battle of panipat before that there was slave dynasty 1 slave dynasty 2 and different dynasties at at the time of the arrival of the portuguese the main power center was the lodi dynasty in central india and towards gujarat there was the begada or the begara mohammed uh, mohammed begara begara dynasty was there from 1458 to 1511 which was probably the strongest towards the coast but northern india was divided the southern india was divided as well in southern india there was the vijayanagar empire there was uh, the deccan empire the bahmani kingdom the bahmani kingdom eventually broke up into five different principalities among them the powerful one was bijapur and with bijapur constant tussle was going on with the portuguese but as i told you at the beginning of the 16th century even goa was captured from the bijapur uh, kingdom so the portuguese set up their base first of all there was no strong ruler in india to thwart these attempts from the europeans to enter into india the second biggest reason was lack of vision of indian rulers now what is the problem here yes there were many dynasties especially the coastal dynasties uh, they could have developed their naval power none of the powers none of the dynasties they had any navy worth its name nor did they think of developing their naval strength in fact please remember this always from indian point of view the big problem is the lack of navy for any dynasty that you talk about talk about the moguls talk about the marathas although marathas and moguls they did try to uh, reinvent or rejuvenate their naval strength but uh, it was very late by that time the british had arrived with a superior force and uh, the, the british used divide and rule policy in india which eventually help them a lot in consolidation so one of the biggest factors in india the problem in india was that we were not a naval force none of the rulers in india be it the mughal dynasty or the or the bijapur dynasty the bahmani kingdom or the or the breakup of the bahmani bahmani kingdom later on uh, the wodeyars or the marathas nobody focused on naval force being a no, naval force per se in fact uh, before that around Uh, around the cholas what we call imperial cholas they were considered as the naval power in india when uh, the entire bay of bengal was called the chola sea they had captured many territories in the southeast asia also but that was during the medieval period in the modern period the biggest problem is lack of navy in india now apart from no strong ruler in india or a unified force in india and lack of vision of indian rulers the third biggest reason for the rise of portuguese initially was that they had a head start they had no stiff competition from europeans for almost half a decade in the initial time from 1500 to i can say 1600 almost for a century they did not have any stiff competition from any of the european powers that is why they could expand continuously throughout the coast of india the western coast many parts of eastern coast and towards the southeast asia that was the reason they had a head start so what all territories did they expand what was their administration like in india many coastal parts of india had come to portuguese power within the 50 years itself by 1550 the western coast belonged to the portuguese many parts of eastern coast also belonged to them what are the areas that they captured 60 miles of the coast of goa was their territory yes they had continuous tussles with the bijapur rulers but nonetheless they had control on the west coast from mumbai to daman to diu and to the approaches of gujarat everything belonged to them they controlled a narrow tract of the western coast along with all the major important ports hundreds of towns and villages were controlled by them they ventured into the south also and towards the eastern side also they ventured into the south some sea fortresses of south like mangalore kanannur cochin and calicut they belonged to them apart from that the most important thing about the portuguese is that they survived in india for longest they left india in 1961 from goa and daman and diu so from the time they came in 1498 they have been the longest colonizers in india 
till 1961. Do remember this. How did they manage this? As I told you, in India, the kingdoms were divided. The Portuguese, they played a role of balancing. They became a balance of power with other powers like Vijayanagara Empire initially, the Deccan Sultanates after the Vijayanagara Empire was gone. Then came the Bijapurs, the Barichais of Bida, the, the Ahmednagar rulers. Then the Deccan Sultans or the breakup of the Bahamani kingdom later on. The Mughals and the Marathas because these were the major powers in India at that time. They played a balance between these forces and somehow survived. They did not focus on expanding their own area too much. They focused on the coastal region and I would say 50 to 60 miles off the coast of, of the western coast of India. And they focused mainly on trade and profits. Now in terms of in terms of administration, initially there was just a governor they used to send. As I told you, Francis D. Almeida, there was Alfonso D. Albuquerque, Nino da Cuna. Along with him, there was a secretary and later on, uh, in the in the fag end of uh, the 16th century, there was a council also with the governor who used to take decisions on Indian territories. The, uh, the important revenue officer in the Portuguese administration was whether the fazanda, whether the fazanda was responsible for revenues and cargoes dispatch of fleets. As I told you, these people are majorly traders. They, they only bothered about the profits. That is why they did not expand their territories too much. Uh, they thought that if we control the coast, we control the trade. That was their belief system. But a biggest drawback or a flaw of the Portuguese administration was their zeal to promote Christianity. Now, this was not just the problem of the Portuguese, but the problem of the Spanish as well, later on the British as well. As I told you, there was a constant tussle between Christians and Muslims. There was crusade from Christian side or the uh, the Pope side, then there was jihad from the Islamic side, a constant tussle of conversion, reconversions going on. So when these people ventured out for geographical discoveries, they had a very important thing in their mind that we are going to spread the word of the Christ. And Portugal did it very, very zealously. So in India, wherever you see towards the coast, even today in Goa, you will find a very Christian flavor in, in, the, uh, in the entire uh, day to day living also there. Right? So, you can see uh, their zeal of Christianity was one of the pitfalls for them in India. Uh, we'll talk about that in some time. Right? So, what was their administration like? They ruled through a governor, but they never ventured out to expand more and more of their territories. They focused more on ports and on profits. Right? But the Portuguese power, it declined. By the end of 16th century itself, it declined and from the beginning of the 17th century, more or less, they had territories of Daman, Diu and Goa. They were, they were mainly confined to these areas itself. Slowly and steadily, first the Portuguese were defeated by the Dutch, then they were defeated by the English and they were marginalized in the Indian subcontinent. Their, and their entire possessions and uh, their assets in the Southeast Asia were also captured first by the Dutch, then by the British. So Portuguese were marginalized slowly and steadily. Till the end of 16th century, they were a power, but from the beginning of the 17th century, as I told you, the power shifted. The power shifted from Spain and Portugal towards the other European colonizers. Why did the Portuguese decline? What were the factors behind Portuguese decline? The first factor was no able rulers or no able governors being sent from Portugal to India. Perhaps one of the best governors was Alfonso de Albuquerque. After Albuquerque, whoever came, they were rather weak. They were, I would say, more and more business oriented. They focused more on profits. They seldom focused on building the administrative base in India. Apart from that, a big problem with the Portuguese was, was they were intolerant. In fact, many historians say that they were fanatical in their religious matters. If you read about even stories of Alfonso D. Albuquerque, Almeida, Nino da Cuna, especially towards the coastal side, stories from Karnataka, stories from Goa, Daman and Diu, you'll find uh, stories of cruelty. The governors resorting to very harsh punishments. Conversion of, uh, conversion of local people, first of all, they focused on uh, Muslims in India. They started to convert Muslims in India. But uh, after a few decades, they focused on Hindus and their conversion also. So they were quite fanatical in terms of uh, the proselytization, which was a drawback 
because a reaction came from the Indians also towards the bit towards the Portuguese. Apart from that, Portuguese administration they seldom focused on building a base here. They were more of traders. They simply wanted to capture the ports. They simply wanted, I would say, money. In fact, many people dubbed Portuguese as pirates everywhere, not just in India, but everywhere they were called pirates. The governors were called pirates or thugs. The officers were called thugs or pirates. They, they never focused on building a base, building an administration. Apart from that, the Portuguese lost favor with Mughals when, when they attacked Jahangir's ships. They captured uh, Mughal ruler Jahangir's ships and later on the Mughals retaliated and by this time, as I told you, a global power shift also began. Portugal and Spain, they were marginalized in terms of the naval power and the military power and the 17th century belonged to the French, the British and the Dutch. In fact, whatever Portuguese territories were there in the Southeast Asian region, the Dutch captured it. Later on, the English captured it. The English eventually defeated Portuguese in India also. But as I told you, the Portuguese never focused on building an administrative base in India. And they also got an opportunity. They discovered Brazil in Latin America. Now, by this time, the Treaty of Torcedelas, it was no more relevant. So they ventured into Latin American region where they discovered Brazil and moved and focused towards that side. So their attention on India and its territories was reduced. So eventually, the Portuguese declined. But do remember, the Portuguese were the longest to survive in India. They came in 1498. They left India in 1961. Right? Now, after the Portuguese came, the Dutch. The Dutch means? Dutch means the people from Netherlands. Right? Today, we speak of Amsterdam. Right? People from Netherlands, they call Dutch. The Dutch also established this their, their own East India Company in 1602. And please remember... All these countries, be it Spain, be it France, be it British or be it Portuguese, everybody's companies, their name was East India only because they were venturing towards the eastern side. They were looking for East Indies. That means India, um, India, China, Southeast Asia. They were looking for these places. So all these companies were East India Company, the Dutch East India Company, the English East India Company, the French East India Company the Danes or the Danish East India Company, the name was similar. So East India Company of Dutch was established in 1602. They ventured out towards the Indies side, towards us, because the route was known. I told you, the Portuguese, they kept the, the maritime route hidden for a very long time, but eventually the secrets were known and people started to come in India. The Dutch arrived in Masuli Patnam. They set up their first factory in 1605. The Dutch later on established many factories on the Coromandel coast, along the Gujarat coast, in Uttar Pradesh, Bengal and Bihar. In 1609, they opened a factory in Pulikat in the north of Madras also. They, they set up huge factories in India, in Surat 1616, in Bimlipatnam, Karaikal, Chinsura, Baranagar, Kasim Bazar, Balasor, Nagapatnam. Nagapatnam was a very important center of the Dutch for a very long time. In 1658, they set up. It was one of the biggest factories in India, then in Cochin in 1663. As I told you, factory means a storage house where they used to bring the goods and used to ship wherever the trade was needed, right? So Dutch also started to expand. Why? I told you, I'm repeating this again and again, because the 16th century, it belonged to Portuguese and the Spanish, but the 17th century belonged to Dutch. Now, by this time, many of these factories were slowly and slowly and steadily captured from the Portuguese themselves, the Dutch captured many of the Portuguese factories in India as well as in the Southeast Asia. But the Dutch could not consolidate their power. In the 17th century, they won over many Portuguese factories. In fact, they were the most dominant power for European trade in the East. Uh, in fact, for some time, they even thwarted the English threat. They dislodged Portuguese completely from the Malay Straits and Indonesian Islands. So, Dutch became very prominent towards the East Indies. In 1623, they even defeated English attempts to establish themselves in Southeast Asia. But over a period of time, the English prevailed. The Anglo-Dutch rivalry, it continued for many years. It continued for seven to eight years. Finally, Dutch lost all its settlement to British one by one. 
and they were finally defeated in the battle of bedara in 1759 please remember battle of bedara 1759 the dutch were defeated by the english battle of bedara or it is also called as battle of hugli right battle of hugli or battle of bedara in 1759 dutch were defeated by the english and again do remember the dutch as well as the danish people will discuss danish people in some time the dutch and danish as well as the portuguese they never focused on establishing their rule anywhere again they were focusing more and more on trade after the dutch decline the danes came the danes established their east india company in 1616 they arrived in india in 1620 they set up their first factory in 1620 later on they also set up a factory in serampore in bengal in 1676 serampore became the danish headquarter when i say Danes, it means people from Denmark, right? So the Danish East India Company, they set up some factories in India in the 17th century. But the Danes could not strengthen themselves. Again, the Danes did not have any colonial interests. They did not have any administrative interests in India. They simply wanted to trade. Eventually, the English prevailed. The English slowly and steadily consolidated their rule in India and all the Danish settlements were sold to British in 1845. So the Danish East India Company finished in India in 1845. Everything was transferred to the English. So the Portuguese, they came, they, this, they remained for a very long time, but they were marginalized. When the British rule was consolidating, the Portuguese remained as a marginal power in Goa, Daman and Diu and in some pockets. So the Portuguese, they came and left. The Dutch, they came on the left. The Danes, they came on the left. Who consolidated the power? It was the English. After the Dutch, the English came. Slowly and steadily, English gained the power. A major, major battle ensued between English and the French for a very long time. Not just in India, but do remember, the French and the English, they fought many wars in the northern American continent also. So today we spoke about the Portuguese, the Dutch and the Danes. In our next lecture, we'll talk about how the English consolidated their rule in the Indian subcontinent and we'll talk about the Anglo-French rival. That is it in today's lecture. Till we meet next time, please stay safe and sound and prepare on your schedule. Do not lose track of your schedule. All the very best.